Listen to the conversation between Bob Wills, who is a foreign student advisor at a language school, and Angela Tung, who is a student, and complete the form. First, you have some time to look at questions one to eight on the form now. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully, and answer questions one to eight. Hello, Foreign Student Advisors Office. This is Bob Wills speaking. Can I help you? It's Angela Tung here, Bob. I'd like to make a request for special leave. Can I do that over the phone? Hello, Angela. You can make that request by phone, but I'll have to fill the form out. Let me get the special leave form. Okay, here it is. Hmm. Tell me your student number, please. It's H for Harry, five seven one two. H five seven one two. Okay. What's your address, Angela? I live at ten Bridge Street, Tamworth. Ten Bridge Street, Tamworth, and your phone number? The telephone number is eight one zero six seven four five. Thanks. What course are you doing? I'm in the writing class. Writing. Who's your teacher this term? Mrs. Green. She spells her name like the colour. Thanks. Hmm. When does your student visa expire? Let me look. July fifteen. July fifteen. Okay. Which term do you want to take leave? Do you want dates? First, I have to write a term number. When do you want to take leave? In term one. Okay. Term one. Now, can you tell me what are the exact dates? I'd like to be away May thirty-one to June four. Okay, I've got that. You'll miss four working days between May thirty-one and June four. Is that right? Only three. I'll be away over a weekend. I'll be back at my classes on June five, so that's three days away. Look at questions nine to twelve. Now listen to more of the conversation between Angela and Bob. Why do you want to take leave, Angela? I'm going to visit my aunt May. She's my mother's sister. She and her husband are my guardians while I'm here. Where do they live? About fifty kilometers from here, near Armadale. Do you have to take so long if they live nearby? My mother is coming with me. She's come for a holiday, so she wants to have some time with May, and I want to spend some time with my mother too. Aren't you going home soon? I've applied to extend my time here. I expect to go home in twelve months. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello, welcome to the university. Let me introduce myself. My name's Helen Brown. I'm the International Office Administrator and I'm responsible for looking after students here on scholarships, in particular Chevening Scholars. Perhaps you could introduce yourselves to me. Hi, I'm Ansgar from Grasse in southern Austria. And my name is Magali. I'm from a town near Montpellier, France. It's a pleasure to meet you. Pleased to meet you too. Nice to meet you. So, let's get started. I'm going to tell you about the schedule for today. Today is your orientation day at the university and it's going to begin in half an hour at 10 o'clock with a speech from the Vice-Chancellor welcoming you to the university. That's very nice. Where is it? It's in the main hall on floor three. OK, but how do we get there? From here, the international office, go down the corridor, past the lecture theatre and student common room. Then you'll be at the main entrance and you'll see the lift to your left. Take the lift to floor three and the main hall entrance is after the buffet. OK, floor three after the buffet. I can always find my way to food. So we'll be able to find the main hall, no problem. So after the Vice-Chancellor greets the new students, then 30 minutes later, the Mayor will welcome you to the city. Together it should be about an hour, so it's not too much of a drag. And what happens then? After that, you'll have a meeting with a representative of the British Council, and she will brief you on life in Britain and what your sponsor expects, and of course doesn't expect from you. It will be nice to meet them. Is that in the main hall too? No, but it is on floor three again. With your back to the main hall, go down the corridor past the labs. Sorry? The laboratories, on your right, and the computer cluster rooms on your left, and at the end of the corridor are seminar rooms one and two. Your meeting is in seminar room two. Did you mention what time that is? No, I didn't. It's at 11.15 and it should last about half an hour. You'll meet her a number of times during your studies, so it's important to go to that meeting. OK. I'll make sure Magali is on time. And Scar, I'm always on time. Very well. Now for the final part of the morning and lunch, you'll be with your department. We're both doing biomedicine. Oh, that's interesting. But we're not sure how to get to our department. Well, you don't need to go very far from seminar room two. The laboratories and seminar rooms all belong to your department. So basically, you need to turn left out of seminar room two and go past the next two teaching rooms. Your departmental office is on the left. Will someone be there to meet us? Oh, but of course. At 12 o'clock, the course administrator will meet you at the departmental office and introduce you to members of staff and the head of department, Professor Hinyu. Hinyu? How do you spell that? H-E-A-N-U-E. -E. He will tell you about the department in your course, the coursework and academic life in Britain. Have you both got reading lists? Yes, I have. I'm afraid I haven't. You can get one at that meeting. Then finally, as it's your first day, you'll have lunch with the department staff in the refectory from one to two. Oh, that's really nice. Great. There's just one more thing. In the afternoon, you have the chance to meet other international students in the main hall again. And you can ask them about their time at the university. That's from 2.30 onwards. I'm looking forward to that. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So you're thinking of opening a bank account with us? That's right. And you are an international student at the university? Yes, I am. And how did you hear about us? From Student Services. 
They gave me a list of banks near the university, and I chose this one because you have a branch near campus and a student advisor at the bank. Yes, I'm part of the student advice team. There are three of us here. Right now, I'll go over the services we offer to international students, and then we can go through a few details before we set up your account. Okay. We can offer you a current or check account and a savings account. Do you pay interest on the current account? We do, but not very much. About one point five percent. You get a much better interest rate on the savings account, around four percent. We also give you a free overdraft facility. I'm sorry. If you run out of money, we allow you to spend more money than you have in your account. That's the overdraft, but you can only take out up to one hundred pounds. If you need more than one hundred pounds, then you must tell us before you take any more money out. I see. Now, once your current account is open, then you can set up direct debits for any regular payments you need to make. Could you tell me how that works? Well, for instance, let's take your mobile phone. You have to pay a certain amount every month for it. Yes. So you can tell us to pay that amount each month, and we'll do it automatically for you. I see. As soon as your account is open, we will send you a debit card, which you must sign immediately and keep in a safe place. Then a day or two later, we'll send you a personal identification number. A PIN number. Yes, and you must keep the number secret. You can change it if you like when you use it for the first time, but if you change it, you must remember the number. If you forget or lose the number, then we have to send you out a new card and a number for security reasons. Okay. The next thing you could do is open a savings account. If you know you have to save a certain amount of money to pay your accommodation or course fees, we can open a savings account for you to put aside some money each week or month. How can I do that? You can manage your accounts in one of four ways. You can come into the bank here on the university campus and tell us what you would like to do, or you can call us on o eight four five seven double o four double o four and instruct us what to do over the phone. That's twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. Alternatively, you can manage your account over the internet. I see. You have to go online and register at our website at www. HSBC. Co. Uk. Slash online. Hyphen banking. Before you can use the service. Finally, if you have a digital TV, you can use TV banking by pressing interactive on your digital TV remote control. Oh really? I don't have a digital TV, unfortunately, but I can do the first three things. Now, do you have any insurance? What's that? For example, if you lose something or one of your possessions is stolen, we will cover the cost of it. How much does that cost? It's twenty-four pounds a year, so it really is worth thinking about. I don't need to think about that. I'll take out insurance. I'll arrange that for you as soon as your account is open. Now, would you like to go ahead and open an account with us? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk by a wildlife specialist on a type of bird called a kiwi. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Auckland Zoo on this sunny Sunday afternoon and to our special Kiwi fundraising event. My job is to tell you all about the amazing little Kiwi and your job, hopefully, is to dig deep in your pockets. <laughs> now, for the benefit of our overseas visitors here today, I should explain first of all that the Kiwi is the national bird of New Zealand and sometimes New Zealanders themselves are known as Kiwis. Now, while Kiwis in the wild are a rare sight, the Kiwi as a symbol is far more visible. Apart from being in toy stores and airport shops all over the world, you'll find them on our stamps and coins. The Kiwi is the smallest member of the genus Apteryx, which also includes ostriches and emu. It gets its name from its shrill call, which sounds very much like this. Kiwi! Kiwi! Kiwis live in forests or swamps and feed on insects, worms, snails and berries. It's a nocturnal bird with limited sight and therefore it has to rely on its very keen sense of smell to find food and to sense danger. Its nostrils are actually right on the end of its long beak, which is one third of the body length. Now, here's an interesting fact. Although kiwis have wings, they serve little purpose, because the kiwi is a flightless bird. Since white settlement of the islands, kiwi numbers have dropped from 12 million to less than 70,000 and our national bird is rapidly becoming an endangered species. This is because they're being threatened by what we call introduced animals. Animals which were brought to New Zealand, such as cats and ferrets, which eat kiwi eggs and their chicks. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And so we have launched the Kiwi Recovery Program in an all-out effort to save our national bird from extinction. There are three stages to this program. Firstly, we have the scientific research stage. This involves research to find out more about what Kiwis need to survive in the wild. Then secondly, we have the action stage. This is where we go into the field and actually put our knowledge to work. We call this putting science into practice. And then we come to the third stage, the global education stage. By working with schools and groups like yourself, as well as through our award-winning Kiwi website, we are hoping to educate people about the plight of the Kiwi. As part of the action stage, which I just mentioned, we've introduced Operation Nest Egg, and this is where your money will be going. It works like this. It's a three-stage process. First of all, we go out to the Kiwi's natural habitat and we collect Kiwi eggs. This is the tricky part because it can be very difficult to find the eggs. Then, in safe surroundings, away from predators, the chicks are reared. Now, this can be done on predator-free islands or in captivity. They're reared until they're about nine months old, at which stage the chicks are returned to the wild. So far, it's proving successful. 
And since we started the program, some 34 chicks have been successfully raised this year, and their chances of survival have increased from 5 to 85 percent. However, it's not time to celebrate Kiwi survival just yet. About 95 percent of Kiwi chicks still don't make it to six months of age without protection. Which is why Operation Nest Egg is so important. And we ask you to give generously today. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Listen to the introduction about Tower Bridge and complete the summary. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Tower Bridge is located in one of the most interesting parts of London. On either top of the tower, you can get a bird's eye view of the wonderful scenery all round Tower Bridge. On its south side are many tall old buildings. On its north side stands the Tower of London itself. But Tower Bridge, the first bridge over the Thames, as you travel to London from the sea, is the most famous of them all. Although they look the same age, the tower is almost a thousand years old, and Tower Bridge, which was built in the 1890s, is just over 100. Because of the tall ships up and down the Thames, it was proposed in 1850 that a bridge across the Thames near the tower was most necessary. However, the designers argued about the new bridge for about 30 years. They took so long because they had two big problems. One is that the new bridge must look like the old tower, and the other is that the bridge must not look like a modern bridge. They made it look like the old tower, so everyone was happy. Besides, the most surprising thing about Tower Bridge is that it opens in the middle while big ships are going through to the Pool of London. If you're lucky enough to see the bridge with its two opening arms high in the air, you'll never forget it. The bridge took eight years to build and cost £900,000, a lot of money in those days. But it was a wonderful success and became a famous tourist attraction in London on the day when the bridge was completed. A hundred years ago, the Thames was once London's busiest traffic route, so that the bridge opened at least 12 times a day. Today, big ships don't go so far up the Thames. Tower Bridge opens perhaps only twice a week but the same wonderful machinery is still in good condition. Green, yellow and red, the colourful wheels and engines look smart and new, not a hundred years old. They still lift the two heavy opening arms, each 1,000 tonnes, leaving 70 metres for the ships to go through. And they still can open and close the bridge in one and a half minutes. 
Things are changing greatly now at Tower Bridge. The horses that used to help with pulling have gone, and so have the tugs, for they are no longer necessary. The walkways from one tower to the other at the top of the bridge were closed years ago because so many people jumped off them into the Thames, which is said to open again soon. In addition, the beautiful wheels will be part of a special exhibition for the public to visit. There'll be a restaurant in one of the towers and a pub in the other. But whatever happens in its exciting future, Tower Bridge will always mean London. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.